Welcome to the BSA Codes Committee uh, for our July meeting. My name is Andrew Kohler. I am joined today by Tarek Lesquieu, my co-chair. Um, Drake Jacobs, our co-chair co emeritus, uh, will be re rejoining us in a few minutes. He's just stopping to drop his wife off at the tea. Uh, we are joined this morning by Sarah Vermeil, a scholar, architectural, or uh, historic preservation consultant, uh, an academic, and she is going to be talking to us today about the rise of general contracting in America. Uh, we are really excited at the prospect of this uh, presentation because I'm sure most of you probably have never seen a presentation on it, myself included. Uh, there's something really novel about this um, since we've all lived in a time when general contracting is kind of ubiquitous. We see and deal with it every single day. Um, this meeting is probably going to be a little atypical for us. We are usually joined by John Nunnery, the executive director of AIA Massachusetts for about a half hour to give an update on legislative and government affairs. Um, to John's credit, he's on vacation this week. Uh, and rather than pulling him off a beach somewhere, uh, we're okay with it. We're gonna let him have a good time. <laughs> um, he did give us a brief update um, from the latest BBRS meeting. Honestly, it's not a whole heck of a lot to um, to explain. Essentially, the BBRS is, has a couple of different committees that are looking at the 10th edition, and they're going through the international uh, suite of codes to figure out which chapters they like, which ones they want to amend, and how they simplify, ideally, hopefully, simplify things in the future. All of that is still a work in progress. Um, some are going smoother than others. I sit on the uh, flood zone advisory committee and I can say firsthand, yeah, some of this is going a little slower than it really needs to. It is what it is. Um, this meeting was originally pitched as a joint meeting with the historic uh, preservation committee uh, at the BSA. I did see Jack Glassman is here in the uh, participants. Um, Jack, if you want Morning. to- for a second i just again if you have any announcements um please feel free to, to share them good morning uh no no announcements uh, i'm just uh i was just happy to, i just said yes to this great idea so uh and then i decided to stay out of the way so um <laughs> nothing that's of a of particular you know import this week so thanks okay thanks jack appreciate it um so with that said uh, I am going to copy and paste the AIA uh, continuing education credits link into the chat box. Um, if you go on that and you are an AIA member, we just need your name and your AIA number. <laughs> if you are not an AIA member, uh, but you would like to get a certificate for joining today, uh, just give us your name and your email. Um, BSA requests not to give both the AIA number and the email. It just creates a little extra work for them. Uh, so we try to keep things simple. Um, please take advantage of the chat box. I'm going to try to keep everybody on mute throughout most of the meeting. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate. Uh, drop them in the chat box. You can send them to either everybody, myself or Tarika, and we will be happy to convey those questions to our speaker when there's a natural stopping point in the presentation. Um, as we get to the end, I'm not opposed to opening up the chat, the, uh, the microphones and letting anyone ask their questions directly if it makes it easier. Uh, since we're skipping John's presentation this month, in theory, we may end up actually coming out with about an extra half hour, 45 minutes, whatever it may be, uh, to end early. Or again, yeah. if we've got a ton of questions, I'm sure Sarah will be more than happy to engage. Um, we are going to record this presentation today. We have got a few people that have asked to see it after the fact. Um, and Sarah has acknowledged that she has a, well, she's not sharing the presentation itself. She has written an article on this uh, subject matter, and she'll be happy to share that with us. Um, so with that said, I introduce Sarah Vermeil. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> so let's start the screen share here. Go. Okay, is that good? Everyone can see that? Looks good to me. Okay. So uh, today I'll be presenting the early history of general contracting for buildings in the United States. And um, I'm going to answer these questions. 
When did general contracting come into existence? What system for producing buildings preceded it? What conditions allowed its emergence? And who were some of the early general contractors? Okay. So um, I'd like to take a minute to explain a bit about the field in which I do research, which is called construction history. Uh, the, the definition that's on the slide here is, you know, it's a little skimpy, um, but at least it's short. And it comes from the website of the Construction History Society in the UK. Um, there are many aspects of the construction industry that historians and other history fields don't deal with, like the history of contracting and construction firms. That was one of the main reasons why the Construction History Society in the UK was founded in 1985. There is an American branch of the society and many countries in Europe and around the world have their own associations for the field. People who do construction history research come from various backgrounds. There are architectural engineers, structural engineers, architectural historians, architects, veterans of the construction industry, archeologists, conservators, and even a historian of technology, which is me. And this is um, just referencing a, um, that they meet, um, there's a construction history Congress that meets every three years. And it was just this past summer in Portugal by Zoom. So not really in Portugal, but anyway. <laughs> now on to my presentation. So, um, no doubt some of you have seen this image showing the modern architect circa 1854. You can guess which person is the architect. Usually writers who use this image say it shows that architects at the time were trying to elevate their status above that of artisans. But what interests me about that image is uh, where the architect is shown and what he's doing. He's in the field, not in an office, having a job conference with the workmen, not at a drafting table. And indeed, because of how buildings were produced in the 1850s, architects and their representatives had to spend a lot of time at job sites. In the following decade, things began to change. So I'm going to preview uh, the points I'm going to be making and I'll summarize them again at the end. But um, before the mid 19th century buildings, and I mean basically um, larger buildings, more complex buildings were produced under separate contracts, one with each of the main tradesmen. Architects and um, most buildings didn't have architects, but when one was involved with a project and if he was paid to do this, the architects oversaw the work. At any rate, there were no general contractors. As the volume and size of projects increased over time and the problems of managing projects likewise increased, general contractors for buildings came into being. And this would be you know, not long after this period, it would be sort of the later 1860s and, and early 1870s. And by taking over the management of construction, the general contractors allowed architects to spend more time doing other tasks, particularly concentrating on design. Not all architects welcomed the advent of general contracting. Some believed it would undermine the architect's traditional position as the leader in a building project or would result in inferior work. Thus, even as the general contracting business became established, some architects continued to prefer the separate contract system, even into the 20th century. Nevertheless, general contracting was well established by then. So why are they called contractors? The names of various building tradesmen like carpenter, mason, <coughs> sorry, mason, glazier, joiner are very old words, unlike the term contractor, meaning a construction contract. 
So here are men doing um, their trades and they're called joiner and carpenter. Um, there's a whitewasher um, and a stonemason. Uh, actually, these are uh, German men, um, but um, <laughs> so their names are in German. But anyway, so these are these these trades uh, had their names. Um, and by the way, these are uh, apparently sketches of real people. Now, <clears throat> contractor, uh, you know, can mean anyone that's party to an agreement to supply something. Um, but I found in my research that when the first, uh, the word first comes into use in colonial America, it refers to individuals who supplied goods and services to the government. And it was the government, as well as private corporations, these early private corporations, that undertook the first large scale construction projects. And these were transportation projects. In colonial times, large construction projects like this were rare. Uh, and the few examples, um, like the very early canals and river navigation improvements, were built with direct labor which is also called day work and not by contract. At the end of the 18th century, the number of transportation projects increased and were more technically challenging and longer term. The takeoff uh, for construction contracting was the start of the canal age. The Middlesex Canal, which is running from Boston to Lowell or Lowell to Boston, <laughs> was the first large American canal. And unlike earlier canals and river improvements, it was built mainly, but not exclusively, um, by contract. Hi, Drake. <laughs> uh, an early advertisement for the canal announces that, quote, work on the line is now open for contracts and proposals will be received by the superintendent or overseers of particular parts of the work." Unquote. The individuals and companies who made agreements to construct sections of this canal did not come from the traditional building trades. They weren't these carpenters and joiners and so on. Most of the men who took the contracts were farmers. Contracting was simply a new occupation. The men made agreements to handle excavation, grading, building embankments, and so on for the canal. And they came to be known as contractors. So that's where the term came from. However, when construction on the canal began, as I suggest, there practically weren't any contractors. <laughs> So the Middlesex Canal Company actually bought the tools, um, the shovels, wheelbarrows, and so forth, and supplied these to the contractors so they could do their work. Following the completion of the Erie Canal, canal construction boomed. The Erie was built by contract, and so were nearly all of the canals that were built after it. For public works, building by contract became the norm. As the Middlesex, um, uh, as with the Middlesex, many of the men who bid on the Erie contracts were new to the business. How did they begin? On both the Middlesex and the Erie um, and other projects of the period, the work on the canal was divided into sections and also there were individual structures. Um, and this allowed these, these new contractors to bid on them. A section would be um, maybe a mile long or, or, or even less. So the men could build, uh, bid on this single section or maybe uh, more than one section or on a structure like a, um, a bridge over the canal or whatever. And then after completing the job with you know, their limited resources and teams, some would then bid on another contract. And when the canal was finished, uh, some went on to um, other canal projects. So for example, um, many of the Erie contractors 
moved on to the Blackstone Canal um, in Massachusetts, uh, which was started just as the Erie was being finished. From the 1830s on, contractors had a range of projects to bid on, in addition to canals, such as bridges, waterworks, river and harbor improvements, and most importantly, railroads. So this is an image of uh, one of the first American railroads. It was built in the 1830s. It's the Philadelphia and Columbia in Pennsylvania. And this is showing, if you see in the middle, that's the Great Bridge over the Schuylkill. And uh, this is the Belmont Incline Plain. So the first thing <laughs> when you reach the west side of the Schuylkill was going up this very steep hill. And that was um, with a um, continuous chain pulling the train up. So the proliferation of projects allowed early contractors to make contracting a career if they wanted to. The term contractor became associated with construction. For example, this is the contractor's book of working drawings of tools and machines used in the construction of canals, railroads, and other works, et cetera. And um, it's a little small, but, but there um, in the image at the top on the left is the contractor's camp. So as you can imagine, uh, you know, this was being built, these roads in the middle of nowhere, and that was also part of the life of contracting was in these remote camps. Anyway, and then this on the, on the right is, um, an example of one of the machines illustrated in the book. Okay, so to recap, the term contractor, meaning a construction contractor, emerged in the early 19th century in connection with public works and engineering construction. So now I'm gonna go on to building, uh, building contracting, um, but if anyone has any, any questions so far, I can, handle them or just continue? As of right now, we don't have anything posted in the uh, chat box, so. Okay, so on know. we go. Okay, so unlike the transportation projects, buildings in colonial North America were constructed by tradesmen in traditional occupations. House constructors were called carpenters, builders, or house rights in New England. Before general contracting, the usual way buildings were put up was with separate contracts, one for each trade. Whole contracts, um, and I mean um, a contract to put up a whole building, were known in uh, colonial and um, early national America. Um, but the usual buildings of the time were small. Yet even on small buildings, um, there could be more than one trade and therefore more than one contract. So for example, um, the town of Boston built a house for a school teacher around 1700. And I don't have an image of this house. I've read the contract, um, but from the description, it looked like one of these houses with the little gable roof. It looked exactly like that. Um, anyway, um, the, uh, the project involved contracts. So for a little house like that, uh, there were three contracts with the carpenter, the mason, and a painter. Um, and usually the carpenter would be the uh, lead tradesman and would design a house. How did this uh, separate contract system work? So I'll describe the process for buildings that were designed by architects and when an architect was hired to supervise. So supervision was considered a separate responsibility and the architect received a separate fee for doing the supervision. So the architect would design the building and make drawings and specifications. He would obtain bids from the various trades and a contract would be uh, written with each tradesman. Each contract would state the name of the parties 
describe the work, state the start and end dates for the work, the price, and importantly, the payment schedule. Specifications and drawings would be attached or referred to in the contract. And the architect would approve the work as it was completed and with his approval, the tradesman could be paid. And I'm not discussing mechanics liens, but actually they go way back to the early, um, early 19th century. Sarah, if I may, we actually have two questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, first one. Uh, you're talking about a new larger scale of buildings and construction developing in the 19th century, prompting the need for the general contractors. But there were many large construction projects in older times, churches, for example. How were construction projects organized and managed prior to this? Right. Separate contracts when there were contracts, but mainly days work. So each, it was like a labor force. Everybody would be um, paid um, individually. It was you, you didn't have contracts. Um, so it would just be the architect essential, or engineer essentially in the lead guiding everybody, correct? Right, a, a, a big workforce. Right. And there would be foremen or um, you know, masters of different trades, mm -hmm. but there weren't contracts, no. And the, the second question was for the early period of the term, the contractors were actually workers or, or hiring or were they hiring others? They were hiring. They, if, if when this contract, when the contract system began, the contractor was responsible for um, finding employees. So the employees were working for the contractor. And if the, if the company wanted to do it on day's work, like how the cathedrals were done, they would hire workmen and have their own um, foremen or superintendents uh, oversee. I think that actually answered the secondary question. One person was uh, very taken with the notion of the day laborers, even for very large monumental projects and referenced the European cathedrals. Um, and obviously just referenced that. So I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So um, let's see, where was I? Uh, let's see. So, um, Oh yeah, one thing I just wanted to mention was that the term um, workmanlike, which still appears in <laughs> contracts um, as you know, to build well and workmanlike is already being used in the 17th century. Um, so contracts in the colonial and early national periods could be lump sum, as we know, a, a price for specified work, or they could be by measure such as cubic yards of brickwork. Most building contracts in New England, I'd say, um, were lump sum. But in Philadelphia, for example, um, measure was commonly used because they had this um, particular organization called the Carpenters Company. And, um, you know, reputable members of the Carpenters Company could be, um, made um, measurers or um, valuers of carpenter's work. And this is a rule book um, from the carpenter's company. And in it, it had the prices for all different kinds of, of work. So um, that's what was used um, to, to, you know, a, a, as work was being done to value it and to pay the work, the uh, work workers or by contract. <laughs> Um, and in fact, most public works were paid by measure. So, um, you know, how many yards of, of earth, how many perches of stone, you know, that's, that's how it was valued and paid. And um, in that case, the superintending engineer uh, for the section of the work or the, the division of the road would, would do the measuring. Sarah, we have a question from uh, Jack. Um, did this great European like shipyards, which has a very complex process of building sailing ships with thousands of parts and many trades involved, is it possible that that influenced the development of building contracting? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> and in fact, I'm, I'm working on a study of, of whether public works contracting 
influence building contracting. And what I found is that these are, are rather separate worlds. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> there's, you know, it's just, it's just rather specialized. Building contractors didn't build roads. You know, it, um, okay, well, so um, we have our public works uh, becoming larger, you know, um, bigger bridges and, and so forth. Um, and, and so by the, by the mid 19th century, likewise, we are getting, you know, larger and, and more complex buildings and there's more and more of them. And there's also new structural materials like um, structural iron um, in, in this period. And um, the projects are involving many different trades and they are taking a longer time to complete and, um, and they cost a lot of money. Uh, so this, this changing building situation, I believe, laid the groundwork for the rise of the general contractor. So I think that this was a necessary condition, this changing situation for buildings, but it wasn't sufficient. And for this new business model, the general contractor to, you know, flower, um, the constructors had to have capital. And, and so contracting is unusual um, in that there's not a, you know, a steady, let's say, stream of, of income from various suppliers. The payments are periodic. And um, so the contractor has to have enough money to pay his workmen, suppliers, and so forth um, until he gets his periodic payment. And um, usually the contractors built up their own capital in order to expand and take more projects. So they could do more as they, as they had more capital from retained from their earnings. Um, I know that some could borrow like from family and friends. I don't know how many banks were, you know, you could go to a bank as a contractor without any assets and get, get a loan. I think that was unlikely, which is why they were using retained earnings. Um, but another way they would finance their work was by getting long credit from suppliers. So they wouldn't pay their suppliers for a long time and use that as essentially a loan um, until they got paid. Um, another necessity was that tradesmen would be willing to work for them as subcontractors or even as employees um, rather than as uh, independent uh, tradesmen. So that had to be worked out and it, it, it was worked out, um, but these things worked out at different rates in different parts of the country. And of course, these guys had to have a lot of ability and nerve too. <laughs> when you see some of the things they did at the time, it's kind of incredible. Anyway, so uh, now our definition. Um, uh, and uh, how, did, how did these tradesmen, um, you know, these carpenters and masons and house rights um, come to be called contractors? And I think the term came from public works. Uh, and also from um, the government. And I'll explain that in a moment. But here's my definition. Um, so the term general contract, I'm just reading this, refers to individuals who and firms that constructed buildings and took whole contracts to construct all or most of a building and erected large and complex projects. So that's to distinguish from the whole contracts for small buildings in the early days and importantly involved more than one trade. And some of the work was done by the contractor's own workforce. And that also distinguishes something from what you might call a building broker who would take a contract uh, only intending to um, you know, sell it essentially to somebody else. So um, that several trades were involved in one contract is the reason I think the business was called general contract.
And in the UK, the term general contractor is sometimes used to refer to um, public works contracting, but we don't do that here. Um, if you say general contractor, everyone assumes you mean a building contractor. And um, if you use the term contractor, um, you know, you could be referring to a, um, a public works contractor, a road contractor, or um, an engineering contractor. So the practice of general contracting was coming into existence in the 1850s and 1860s, even before it had a name. And one of the first clients to consistently use general contracts was the federal government. During the 1850s, the US Treasury Department built dozens of public buildings all around the country for civil purposes, post offices, federal courthouses, custom houses, marine hospitals, and other kinds of buildings. And the government wanted to put these up under single contracts. So I'm gonna show you some of these buildings, a number of which survive, including this beauty in Maine. Um, here's another one in Portsmouth. So while the government sought builders to take whole contracts, the general contracting business didn't exist. This is the 1850s. Nevertheless, the government was in a position to get what it wanted and builders figured out a way to comply. Designs for these federal buildings were prepared centrally in Washington in the office of the supervising architect of the Treasury Department. The plans and specifications for each project were printed and it, like this design for Portsmouth's New Hampshire Custom House, which is the building we saw a photo of. Prospective bidders could request copies of these plans and specifications. Here's another one. Uh, to make their estimates. Bids were received at a designated time, were opened simultaneously, and the lowest acceptable bidder would be awarded the contract. The government appointed local superintendents to oversee the work at each of these job sites, and they were all around the country. And here's one more example of these buildings from the 1850s Fortunately, still standing and looking good. Now I've come across um, a few large private buildings from the mid 19th century that apparently were or may have been built under general contracts. Uh, the Academy of Music in Philadelphia is one of these. John Jones quote, was engaged for the principal construction of the building, unquote. And he was listed uh, among the people who worked on the project as a general carp uh, contractor and carpenter. Um, but in researching the building, um, there were many other tradesmen who worked on it too. And whether these tradesmen were subcontractors to Jones or had separate contracts I'm not sure. So there were some cases, um, you know, like the Academy of Music and the federal buildings that used general contracts. Um, still, I, I would not say this is the start date for general contracting. These are unusual cases. It was after the Civil War that uh, there's clear evidence of tradesmen becoming general contractors. And I would say in the 1870s, the, um, the business took off. So one of the early firms that made the transition from carpenters to general contractor was Norcross Brothers of Worcester, Massachusetts. In the late 1860s, James and Orlando Norcross, who trained and began their work lives as carpenters, began to take single contracts for large masonry buildings. Trinity Church in Boston was an early major contract for Norcross Brothers 
So as everyone knows, this is a massive church and it's built on piles, unfilled land. And um, the weight of the tower actually was, um, was quite a worry uh, at the time um, and was evaluated by a famous engineer, um, James Francis of Lowell, um, as to its, its stability because it was so heavy. So here's Norcross Brothers bid for the work. <laughs> it's one page and I'm going to read what I have here. This is a transcription quote. We propose to furnish all material and do all labor necessary for the building of the Trinity Church edifice according to the plans and specifications made by H.H. H. Richardson architect. Um, the outside facing of Dedham Granite for the sum of, and they write it out, but it's $355,000. So uh, this company um, worked with its own employees. So it hired all its workmen and its foremen, and uh, it didn't subcontract. And Norcrest Brothers also um, bought and leased quarries to supply uh, stone for its projects. It supplied the stone for this building. Um, and it had a, a large workshop in Worcester where it did its own millwork. And I meant to say that, you know, a few years before this, they built their first building with a general contract. Here, they're, they're building a, a building that's, you know, was at the, you know, it's equivalent to $8 million, um, which is kind of amazing in, in only a few years. So famously, Norcross Brothers built nearly all of architect H.H. H. Richardson's later projects, wherever they were in the United States. And this was uh, also rather unusual. Um, contractors tended to work in their region, at least, if not entirely locally because that's where they would build up um, you know, their reputations. Um, but Norcross was able to follow Richardson, who as a famous architect was getting jobs around the country. Um, this is also a building built by the Norcross brothers. And they built the Custom House Tower, which was plunked down inside. <laughs> Amy Young's 1830s custom house on Quezon Foundations. And this was an especially challenging project. Um, and they built a very straight tower, which did not lean. <sighs> Another place where you can see the transition from tradesman to general contractor is in the business records of the prominent New York architect George B. Post. Some of the tradesmen who worked on Post's projects under separate contracts began to bid on whole buildings and thereby become general contractors. One of these was David H. King Jr. King began working as a constructor in 1870. At the end of that decade, he worked on Post's Historical Society building as a mason and carpenter and was the lead tradesman on this project. But there were separate contracts with the other trades and material suppliers. For example, for the stonework, there was a separate contract for roofing and metal, for the ironwork and for the architectural terracotta. But soon after that, um, King began to uh, bid for whole contracts to build Post's projects. And you can see in, um, in Post's business records, which fortunately survive, um, sometimes people would bid for separate trades and sometimes they'd bid for the whole contract. So this was um, a transition period and it was you know, up to Post how to um, award the work. Um, anyway, um, in 1881, um, King, um, won this $1.2 million contract to build a nine and a half story office building for Post 
Um, this is the Mills building in New York City. In 1884, King won general contracts to build Post's Hamilton Club building in Brooklyn and the Mortimer building in New York City. And King became a prominent contractor and real estate developer. And I just wanna mention, this is another one of my um, findings for I think how these men were able to expand and become big. Um, they built what was called on their own account. So King, for example, built a hotel. And I think he was then, he would be able to use um, well, both income from the hotel, but also the hotel as collateral to get a loan. So exactly when the concept of construction loans um, came into being, I, I don't know, but I think that was why um, these early contractors, uh, they basically had to have their own money. I don't think that that was available to them, um, but a lot of them did build on their own account. So another constructor who worked with George Post and made the transition to general contractor was Viner J. Hedden. Hedden trained as a carpenter and with a partner, J.J. Meeker, built buildings and at least one bridge in New Jersey in his early days. In the 1880s, Meeker left the firm and Hedden's sons joined. And then they began to take general contracts. Their first general contract for a George Post project was for a factory in Newark in the early 1880s. Later, they built this building, um, which Post designed, the uh, Prudential Life Insurance Company in Newark. And this is another thing that just fascinates me is, is how quickly a lot of these, um, these companies went from small starts to you know, really quite large projects. The Hedden firm um, became important general contractors in New York and New Jersey. And like Norcross Brothers, in the 19th century at least, the firm worked with its own employees rather than mainly subcontracting. And supplied materials it used, like trim and sash, brick, etc., from its large manufacturing plant in East Newark. So again, like Norcross, they have, they have a, a, a big shop where they're, um, they're, they're making their own millwork and also own brickworks and quarries um, and are supplying all their own materials for the most part. In 1917, Lewis Hedden, one of Viner's sons, joined with Theodore Sterrett and others to form an engineering contracting firm, Hedden Pearson Sterrett Corporation. And I'm going to be mentioning the Sterrett's more in a moment. Okay, so um, another interesting um, early general contractor, um, one who isn't associated with either Richardson or George Post is George A. Fuller. George Fuller was from Massachusetts, and I'm not being um, <laughs> chauvinistic here. It's, it's just sort of interesting. Anyway, um, he trained as an architect and worked in his uncle's firm, um, Earl and Fuller in Worcester, um, at which time that firm was um, helping with a project that the Norcross brothers was building. Maybe that's how he got the idea of becoming a general contractor. Uh, later, Fuller worked for Peabody and Stearns, but he seems to have been more of a, um, a project architect rather than a designer. And around 1881, he left architecture, moved to Chicago and became a builder. The early 1880s was a takeoff period for large commercial structures, 10 stories or higher, and Chicago was a center of this development. Fuller's company built this landmark of early commercial architecture, the Rookery Building, which fortunately is still standing in Chicago. 
And in fact, Fuller's company built most of the celebrated pioneer skyscrapers in Chicago. And if you've taken an architectural history course, you will recognize these names. I mean, these are all the, the famous early uh, pioneer skyscrapers. And the Fuller Company built them all. Unlike Norcross and the Hedden firms, uh, Fuller did not employ a, you know, his, his own workforce, but um, used subcontractors primarily. Another feature of Fuller's company, um, which is besides the fact that it's an important one, um, but it's, it was um, particularly um, noteworthy in that it tried to work under cost plus rather than lump sum contracts. So Fuller didn't invent the idea of cost plus contracts or charging a fee to manage um, construction projects but he really helped publicize the idea. And it became surprisingly popular in the, um, at the turn of the century. And a reason that the owners went along with this, um, because they wouldn't necessarily know the final cost, was because um, there was just this fashion, I would say, for speed. Um, these buildings were just being thrown up. It's incredible how fast they went up. And the uh, cost plus contractors were able to start a project before all the designs and specifications were complete. And, and they did. So um, while this was called cost plus, I would say that Fuller was actually working as what we call, call the construction manager today. And by the way, this, this is the Fuller building. Um, this was Fuller Company built this building. So it's called the Flatiron, but it, it was his building. Um, so um, now I'm just gonna talk about this, these cost plus contracts. Um, as I said, it, it, it became um, a, uh, a thing. Um, other contractors adopted the system. Um, although it was controversial, there was this question of whether um, you know, the, the, the charges were fair. Um, but some large builders, especially, um, well, not especially, but, but certainly some of these um, skyscraper builders uh, where the um, idea was to start the construction you know, before everything, all the design was done, um, adopted that system. And um, some of them became large builders like uh, Theodore Sterrett, who founded the Thompson Sterrett Construction Company. Now, I just want to mention him. Um, Theodore got his start in Chicago working for architects. And I just want to say that I think the possibly the idea of charging a fee for managing construction um, was borrowed from architects because essentially that's what they were doing. Um, as I said, there was a separate fee for, for what was called you know, supervision or superintendents. And so that's what um, these architects turned contractors were, were doing when they um, use the cost plus system. Anyway, Theodore started his, um, his work life working for Burnham and Root, um, the architects, famous architects in Chicago, some of whose buildings the Fuller Company built. And in 1890, um, Theodore and the Fuller, uh, George Fuller, um, joined to build a hotel in Chicago that Theodore Sterrett designed. Uh, then they parted ways for a bit and Theodore continued working as a builder, but around 1897, he rejoined Fuller and um, opened Fuller's branch office in New York City. And he left again a couple years later and started um, this firm, uh, Thompson Sterrett Construction Company. And this firm preferred to work with cost plus contracts. <laughs> 
Um, and it did in the case of this bullet. Meanwhile, um, Theodore's younger brother, Paul, Paul Starrett, became the president of George A. Fuller Company. This is after Theodore had left. And another brother, William Starrett, was vice president of Thompson Starrett when the Woolworth was built. So this is another builder you may have um, heard of, um, Frank Gilbreth. He was famous for his efficiency studies and also for his dozen children. Um, and he, he advertised that he only took cost plus uh, a fixed sum contracts. And here he has at the top, he's explaining the advantages to benighted owners who don't see why they should do this, but he says, you know, in 1902, about half of his work was um, cost plus, and by 1905, it's 100%. So to wrap up, um, at the opening of the 20th century, general contracting was well established in the US. Thus, the Norcross brothers, who in the 1870s called themselves contractors and builders, in the early 20th century, call themselves general contractors and builders. Now, um, just to end up, um, I'd like to consider the impacts of this development for architects. So um, in a 1917 essay about the changes in architectural practice since his career began in 1874, the Boston architect Robert Andrews wrote, quote, apart from the physical inventions, which have added so much to the ease and convenience of modern life, the emergence of the general contractor constitutes the most significant change in architectural practice. Architects previously often functioned essentially as general contractors. Now, builders were stepping into that role. Norcross Brothers, with its own drafting department and construction expertise, allowed art architects like H.H. H. Richardson to build often constructively challenging projects in cities around the country. And by the way, that's um, Richardson himself sort of, he's sitting off to the left there. Coincidentally, I just think this is a weird thing, but anyway, um, general contracting became established at a time when some architects were stepping back from project management. So I've mentioned the, um, the new tall commercial buildings, which required engineering expertise that, you know, an architect's office might not have. And also the field of structural consulting, structural engineers was sort of only getting started. Um, but another factor that influenced the practice at the end of the 19th century was this fashion for Beaux-Arts and uh, classical revival styles. And this fashion, it was part of a, you know, just a mindset um, as to how many architects saw themselves. Um, so some began to see their profession as a branch of the fine arts and themselves as artists. And they, they studied in Paris. They did these you know, very elaborate renderings um, and, and, and drawings. Um, so these art-oriented architects just were less interested in the constructive side of the practice. And uh, general contractors were there to, to step in and, and take over that side of the work. Thus, uh, William Starrett, you know, who, who I mentioned, um, and he was the builder of the Empire State Building, by the way, uh, wrote in his 1928 memoir that with general contractors handling, quote, promotion, finance, engineering, labor, and materials, the architect reverted to his original function of design. Well, that was somewhat wishful thinking, but anyway. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, he, that's basically an advertisement. He's saying, let the general contractor do everything. You guys just work on the pretty stuff. Um, so as I mentioned in my opening, um, not all architects were enthusiastic about the advent of general contracting. 
as of 1907, Cass Gilbert, um, architect and um, started his career in, in Minnesota, was um, a very uh, severe critic. In a report he made to the um, American Institute of Architects about the contracting system, Gilbert complained that the quote, great building company, unquote, as he called them, were only concerned about money and squeezed subcontractors so they could only do the cheapest work. The system was, quote, disastrous to our business interests, destructive of our professional relations with our proper clients, meaning the owners, and absolutely damning to our art, unquote. He urged his colleagues to, quote, revert to the old system of letting special contracts for each important branch, unquote, of the work, and to use money that would be the general contractor's profit as a fund for contingencies and to pay the architect for project management services. I don't know if Gilbert changed his mind a few years later when he got the commission to design the Woolworth building built by one of these great building companies that he reviled. Some architects hung on to the separate contract system, even for big projects. Ernest Flagg, a Beaux-Arts architect, if there was one, used separate contracts to build this 47 floor, 612 foot tall tower. He added a construction department to his office to supervise the project. Flagg was, uh, wa he wanted to be able to pick the subcontractors. And according to a history of the project, there were 100 different contracts and over 40 contractors and suppliers. Nevertheless, the general contract system became more established in the early 20th century. And the construction industry continued and continues to evolve in different ways as conditions change. So to um, summarize, these are my takeaways. So you'll always remember these. So general contracting for buildings takes off around the 1870s in the US. Increasing size and constructive complexity of buildings. I mean, not, you know, there were complex buildings early, but it's just the quantity that makes a difference. It made uh, general contracting attractive and the ability of tradesmen um, to, who became general contracts to accumulate sufficient capital made it possible. Lump sum as well as cost plus contracts were used in the 19th century and general contracting changed architectural practice, but did not, as some men feared, mean the end of the architectural profession. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I will remind everyone if they've got questions, please populate them in the chat now. Uh, we technically have another hour here. We don't have to use all of it for Q&A, but we, we have the opportunity. Uh, Sarah, that was a great presentation. Uh, very interesting. I find it funny that the Fuller Building, i.e. the Flatiron, has been my favorite building in New York City for as long as I can remember, and I had no idea that Fuller was literally the general contractor that built it. Who knew? And, and the, he was the owner. Exactly. He yeah. never made that connection, and I've seen that building more times than I can count. Um, I, I will be happy to kick off uh, a question for you, and I'm just curious. Um, obviously, the field of construction has been a very male-dominated field historically, much as architecture has. And fortunately, in recent years, there's been more architectural scholarship about efforts of pioneering women in the field, uh, Julia Morgan being around that turn of the century time. I'm just curious, in your research, did you find anything about the roles of women in these early general contracting times? No. I, I haven't found a, a, a woman involved. Um, I, I know some people have written um, papers. There, there were some women who managed um, construction firms, but um, I've sort of focused, and so you shouldn't get the wrong idea that the, 
you know, the, these were um, kind of exceptional firms that I've been talking about. These were very mm -hmm. large firms. Most firms are, are not large right. then and now, actually. It's not a, a, an industry that's dominated by large firms. However, um, I haven't found women in, in them. Fair enough. Uh, again, others, if you more comfortable unmuting yourself, as long as we can maintain a sense of decorum, yeah. I don't mind, please. One of the things that um, when I started out with my own practice, uh, when we did project bids, uh, our bid openings were open to all of the bidders to participate. So when they brought their bids in, they would have uh, an envelope or a folder and they would hand them in, we'd have them stacked up. There was a deadline and then the room would fill up with all of the, not just the general contractors, but also many of the subcontractors. And then we'd open the bids up and write the numbers up on the board. Um, so you would know not just the total price, but you would know the prices uh, or the bids for each of the trades. So you'd have the electrical and plumbing and masonry or what have you. And then all of the fellows in the room knew what everybody else was doing. And they had a pretty good idea of how competitive they were. And um, I, I thought that was a great process. Uh, I remember vividly one project that was uh, for a housing uh, project. Um, one of the electrical uh, bidders, after the everybody had left, came to see me and he said, I, have, I think you better watch out on the electrical numbers um, because his number is less than the cost of the materials that I've got in my bid. So it, you, know, you usually write that off and say, well, this is, you know, little bit of talking behind the scenes. And it turns out that in fact, the successful electrical bidder um, had made a mistake. And um, with the client, which was happened to be a uh, municipality, uh, we invited the electrical contractor to come in and uh, discuss his bid. And this is after construction had started. And the Electrical contractor came in and uh, he said he had gone back and looked at his numbers and felt very comfortable with what he had put in. And um, so we said, okay, well, we just wanted to make sure because if there's a problem, we, wanna, we don't wanna have the client at risk. So it turns out that uh, about four months later, uh, the general contractor, as I'm walking through the site, General contractor said, do you notice who is doing the electrical work? And I said, well, I actually haven't. I said, why do you tell me that? He says, well, it's the owner and his son and none of their crew. And um, I said, well, I imagine that's a good thing. They're gonna pay attention and give us good work. And he said, well, it turns out that in fact, they had missed something they had left out all of the switch gear and the major electrical components. And um, they had come to me and they had told me, this is the contractor speaking, that um, there was a mistake made, but that they would stand by their numbers. Uh, and they were particularly concerned to uh, let everybody know that they stood by their numbers because they were, they were actually given the chance to fix it. Um, and to correct the number or what have you. And they just didn't want to let anybody know that they would walk away from their responsibilities. So in effect, the owner got a, uh, a windfall and uh, the owner, to which I mentioned was a municipality, um, would turn to this outfit subsequently for little standalone projects uh, just as a way of saying thank you for being honest. And uh, they had a very good working relationship thereafter. 
Sarah, we've got uh, two questions that have popped up so far. First one is coming from Russ Feldman. Um, are you aware of any failures of the general contracting system in these early days? Builders, for example, that ran out of money or found to have siphoned off money intended for the construction, were the courts involved in a resolution? Well, I haven't gotten into that, but when you read all the complaints, um, <laughs> there are all the usual things. Um, and um, yes, uh, you know, generally, um, you know, in fact, the AIA and um, the you know building industry tried to get together for a uh, a uniform contract, and that was you know because there were so many problems. But even the the contract and one of the you know bitterest complaints was that the you know just the whole concept of of construction was you know that there's a you know a, a greedy contractor on one side. And a, a penny pinching, you know, indifferent owner on the other side, you know, and that this is this is how our world gets put together, you know, and, and the, the contract is sort of predicated on that. And um, you know, so they, you know, why can't we go back to the old days of the cathedrals, you know, with the master builder and you know the happy workmen or whatever? But um, yes, there's many, many problems. As I say, mechanics liens um, came in. Um, quite early because of the problems of con you know, owners not paying. And in fact, I saw one very early contract that um, not only required the workmen, uh, the tradesmen to, to build in a workmanlike manner, but also required the owner to pay <laughs> and said, what would happen if the owner didn't pay <laughs> in the contract, which you know, that's not what you usually see in a contract. Anyway, um, yes, many problems. Um, all sorts of shenanigans, but also, you know, remarkably, a lot of uh, good quality buildings still standing from, from this early period. Uh, Jack is also asking, uh, do you have any interesting anecdotes about the role of liability insurance? Of course, then and now architects would not normally be insured for on-site construction work, but a construction contractors, they would need to be covered. Um, so the, the, just the whole uh, just law of, of responsibility, um, it, you know, evolves. And if, um, if a workman does something to damage something, you know, who, who's responsible? Is it the, the employer? Um, you know, the, Employers, by and large, weren't held responsible for a long time. That that kind of evolved. Um, I know in the in the railroad contracts. So these guys were using, you know, they were blowing things up, you know, they were <laughs> they were taking down hills, and in those contracts that I've seen, the um, the contractor is held completely responsible for everything, and I don't think he was insured. I don't think he could get insurance for that. Um, and that seemed quite unfair, but that's how it was. Um, so, you know, there's some, um, you know, sort of services like insurance, like um, bonding. So, you know, originally bondsmen were friends or they might be, you know, in wealthy individuals who would, who would supply a bond, you know, and eventually, this became a um, you know a service that an insurance company would would do. So these these things changed over time, became more institutionalized. But in the 19th century, yeah, people were really at risk, <laughs> everybody, and it was um, it's just how it was. <laughs> I'm just curious from the academic side of things, and my apologies to anyone that thinks this is a little too esoteric, but would you mind sharing a little bit about your methodology, how you got interested in the subject, and ultimately where you find the research for something like this? Because most people don't generally talk about the history of general contracting. I don't even know where you'd find all of these examples of old contracts to go through. Well, um, again, the, the, the primary sources, so I became interested because um, I worked on the history of buildings. Um, I was interested in buildings built with um, 
new materials of construction in the 19th century, buildings that were called fireproof buildings. So um, that's how I get started. And then the question was, who built these buildings? Um, and you know, it turned out that there, there were certain architects who had um, just a construction expertise. And um, you know, eventually they weren't the ones that were building the buildings. It was, you know, uh, Cass Gilbert could design the Woolworth building, you know, and um, or you know, a lot of tall buildings. And that contractors had stepped in, you know, to supply this expertise that once architects had to supply. You know, once architects, you know, did every did the structural engineering, did everything. Anyway, so then I was interested. You know, then I wondered, well, who who how did that happen? And who were these guys? Um, but for um, source material, so one reason why um, the federal government, you know, is sort of fantastic is that they keep a lot of records and um, there are records for all these buildings, you know, these, these buildings from the 1850s, the records survive and you can even trace the, um, the construction because the, 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 the superintendents at the site would send periodic reports. You could see, you know, what was happening. Um, there are periodicals that finally begin um, you know, um, now for the railroads, there are railroad periodicals quite early, and often the railroads would list the uh, the contractors. You know, who who won contracts for the various sections. Um, architectural periodicals really get going um, in the 1870s a little later, but um, you can see in the architectural periodicals discussion of these. Um, you know, eventually this this concern about contracting and general contracting. Um, one thing that's really lacking are records of contracting firms. And I've tried to work on this to find a place where contractors can leave records. Um, there are pretty good records of just a few firms. Um, and um, those are, are, are quite interesting. Um, sometimes contractors write these, um, you know, sort of vanity books or the George Fuller company, you know, their publicity, but they, um, they'll talk about their history. Um, you know, Fuller has books that where he shows pictures of all his projects. So you can see what he built. And um, so it's a lot of, you know, some published, um, there's not a lot of primary records. There are primary records of some railroads. Um, there's, you know, as I say, government contracts. So it's a lot of different things, but it's a different way of working, I have to say, as a historian, than let's say having a bunch of records, someone's, you know, biography or a collection of records that you're working with. This is, you know, really starting from questions like, well, when did general contracting begin? And then trying to figure out, well, how would I answer that? What materials would tell me? and then try to find those things. All right, we actually have another question just popped up. Perfect timing, Ian. Uh, he recently came across an 1889 Providence City directory with ads for firms describing themselves as GCs, and in one case, noting mills as a specialty. Does this mean that the rise of general contracting in different regions was tied to the emergence of specific building types? Well, as I say, I think it, it had to do with um, the, the expansion of, um, you know, large projects. So um, uh, just as there, as there are more projects, um, you know, it just then, you know, a company that gets started, um, you know, can, can then, you know, keep going. So if you're in a, a place, you know, like, let's say, um, where there aren't a lot of big projects and they can continue to work with separate contracts or with day, lay, uh, day, um, day work system, you probably wouldn't get general contracts. So I think it has to do with, you know, the development of the economy and how many projects there are, how many big projects, you know, where there are opportunities for a general contractor. But the 1880s is, is already, um, 
you know, there are general contractors. Say it, once it got started, it, it got started pretty fast, but you'd, you'd expect to see it in places where there's a lot of building and larger buildings going on. Uh, another question, this one coming from Matt. Um, at what point in time did the general contractor process move into smaller residential and small business projects? So changing scale. Yeah, and, and that I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, you know, they didn't have to call themselves general contractor. You know, they could still call themselves builders, but... Um, uh, I'm sure the records get a lot more spotty when you're getting to something that doesn't right. have uh, the equivalent of a few million dollars in, in budget. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, there there's records, you know, and they're just not preserved, you know, who, who these firms were. And, um, you know, even that they sort of, you know, like I, I talked to a really elderly man whose father was a builder who built houses <laughs> Like yours, Anders. you know, that's when you say you think it's older, but actually they continue to build, you know, this was in the, you know, 1930s. And so, and they still use methods that they'd used earlier. So you wouldn't necessarily know, but he had a workshop, you know, where he did his own millwork. And um, even though he was a, a small contractor building in, in the, um, in the Amesbury area. So, um, you know, you, you could see a house, you know, from the 20s and 30s, it might look like, you know, the turn of the century. And it was because these builders were still using their, um, their traditional practice. Did, you know, they call themselves general, con yeah, they very likely may have because that term, you know, became understood by the public by then. One of the interesting things to see is the publications of the architects. So today, of course, we've got architectural record. There used to be magazines like Pencil Points, Progressive Architecture. Um, and if you look through the older copies, uh, you see the ads for the different general contractors. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked back to anything from you know, the turn of the century but the, um, the Boston Architectural Club had its own publication. I've got copies from two different years. Uh, I don't know how many years they published, but these are um, the size of the old Life magazine. Uh, it's a coffee table size, but uh, it's hard cover and it's got black and white or sepia uh, printing throughout. With, with pictures and plans, many details. Uh, and then in the back of the book, they've got all the advertising for the big contractors and many of the architectural firms. I would suspect that would be uh, kind of an interesting uh, side reference for any history. Um, the other thing that I find rather sad nowadays is that the archives you mentioned that are just not there, um, you know, when a business cl uh, closes, uh, very often their archives just end up in the dumpster. And so that stuff is lost forever. Uh, I live in Melrose and um, there is um, the remnants of the Melrose Historic Society. And I was talking to one of its members and they don't have any place to put their records or their archives and their so they're stored in somebody's you know, barn and that barn is gonna disappear someday you know, when somebody tears it down and they're scrambling to try to find somewhere to put it. So what do they have in these records? Well, they've got uh, photographs. People have uh, contributed you know, their, their family's diaries, their family's photographs of the town uh, the events that went on and so on. There's nowhere to go with that information. So it too is gonna end up in the, uh, in the dumpster. And it's, a, it's kind of a sad thing. And I was wondering if you had any insights into uh, what repositories might be out there. And I'm thinking that, especially the larger or more established uh, general contractors may be willing to move their 
earliest archives uh, into such a repository that could then be useful for researchers? Well, um, so the places that have these uh, business records collections, you know, it, it's um, some state libraries have them. Um, you know, Harvard Business School has, has you know, collections like railroads. Um, the place that I was sort of hoping to have a kind of centralized collection is Hagley Library in Wilmington, Delaware, which is a business history collection, um, and try to start something. Um, but um, it never really got off the ground. I think they would accept records, but one of the issues is what companies think is important and um, you know, what is, you know, who determines what's important and left to their own devices, companies will save their, you know, picture books and maybe some photos, you know, but um, may not think things like contracts are, you know, relevant Well, you know, the building was built, you know, so, you know, so, but um, one of the things we were trying to work on was, uh, you know, guides for companies, you know, what kinds of things uh, would be interesting to, to donate and to donate and have them in this one place so it would be convenient for someone working on this in the subject area to you know have a number of contracts. Um, but as I say, it never got off the ground. You know, and I came across one, you know, one there was one early construction um, um, association where the guy makes a plea to contractors, you know, to save their records. But as you say, you know, you have to have some, some place to put them um, and that wasn't obvious. So it, it is still a problem. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I don't have a good answer at this point. Two additional questions have come in. Uh, first one is coming from Suki. Um, I think you actually used the expression once or twice in the presentation, but could you go back over where the title of master builder fit into this history of builder and architect? Um, that's just an old fashioned term. And it was, um, you know, it was usually, it's, it doesn't have, as far as I can say, any formal meaning, but um, usually um, in um, sort of, uh, let's say medieval times or, uh, you know, that you have um, a, a tradesman who is managing a workforce and, um, you know, in their, their particular trade, like a, a stonemason, mm -hmm. um, you could call that person a, a master builder. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of to distinguish between a contractor there wouldn't be, you know, a, a, a lump sum or a cost plus contract when, you know, you have this master builder involved. It's, it's really sort of for, um, you know, an old fashioned term. And, and considering on the specific terminology, Rick is asking, when did the term construction managers become more common? Uh, what do you see as the distinction between a construction manager and a contractor in these early days? Well, so the, you know, I think it's, it's rather recent. A construction manager is, is sort of latter, probably 20th century, and I'm not sure um, exactly when. But, um, you know, these are sort of reinventions of, of similar practices and to, to solve similar problems is how, how to get a project going before every, you know, document is ready. Um, how to share responsibility and risk fairly among the, the different parties. So I think that the, you know, these cost plus fixed fee or cost plus as a percentage, you know, this was a way of, of essentially doing contract management at this time. So, um, you know, they didn't know everything. They didn't have all the drawings. Um, there often were mistakes in estimating which is why, not to go on a tangent, but 
you know, there were debates at the AIA as to whether the US should adopt the British system of having a quantity surveyor. So in Britain, they have quantity surveyors, which the owner pays for, which estimates all the, um, the quantities. So you don't get the kind of mistake that Drake mentioned where somebody just does the, you know, just makes a mistake. Um, that, that you're telling all the bidders exactly what the different quantities are. Anyway, it, it never caught on here. Just one of those things. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, there, there are just these, these different challenges and, and a lot of them persist, have not gone away. And so the, I think the cost plus was, was a way to try to handle that where you don't know everything there can be mistakes. You don't want to punish people for it, you know, unless it was malicious. You know, rather you'd, you'd like to solve it and get on with the work and get the building done and get a good result. So, um, you know, the cost plus was more flexible that way. But it was like, I'd say construction management mm -hmm. without being called that. <laughs> Sarah, have you um, reached out to the AGC? or any of the other trade organizations uh, to see if any of their members uh, might have these old archives? Yeah, we've, you know, our, the US branch of the Construction History Society have, has tried. It, it takes someone sort of being on top of this and, and no one has stepped up to do that. You know, so, oh, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Let's do it, but somebody like has to make it their, you know, their life's work to sort of make this happen, and it just hasn't happened yet. Well, maybe Matt Johnson will do that when he retires. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Final set of questions. Uh, just one other thing. I'm a chatterbox, I am sorry. Um, there are a lot of uh, reference manuals and handbooks that were generated in the 19th century. And some of them are, well, I don't want to call them arts, work of art, but they're really quite fascinating to see. I've got one in my hand, which is probably the 18th or 20th edition of it. And you are probably familiar with it. It's called the Kidder Parker's Architects and Builders Handbook, and it's uh, rather large. It's almost as big as me. <laughs> uh, and it's full of um, very specific segments of buildings with all kinds of information, rules of thumb, charts, tables, graphs. Uh, if you wanted to calculate a truss and figure out what kind of stresses it can handle, there are graphical tools that are spelled out. And these actually are very accurate. Uh, when I was in, in college, I, when I was taking structures, I found one of these charts and uh, used it as part of my, as a comparison to the numerical uh, analysis. And, uh, and then I realized that from further reading that these are Maxwell diagrams uh, from the uh, British uh, mathematician where he was able to calculate forces. And this was very widely used, I gather, by field engineers building these bridges in the middle of nowhere where the existing conditions are unknown until you're there. So they'd have to, on the spot, try to figure out what to do. And that's where the engineers would whip these fantastic references out and uh, basically save the day, build the bridge, and it's still standing. Drake, I can't agree more. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, I got a, a facsimile copy off Amazon of a 1909 book. Uh, I think the guy's name was Frederick Hodgins or Hodge or something like that. Uh, and it was uh, light and heavy timber framing made easy. And it had this newfangled way of framing, which was balloon framing. And oh, the, the, the details and diagrams of older uh, framing systems. And as it broke it down for how you apply this to mill buildings, to bridges, to silos, to anything and everything. And again, I don't work on too many silos, but I see enough old houses in New England that, you know, there is some good stuff in there. 
And it really does make a big difference in understanding the mindset at the time. Well, one of the things that I find fascinating uh, is only a couple of years ago that I encountered the Historic Resources Committee and Jack and Sarah and some of their colleagues in that absolutely fascinating group. Um, when we had a joint meeting um, of the Coates Committee with the Historic Resources, um, it was just like opening a, another door to another room. Uh, you know, they say that architecture is a house with many rooms. Um, and it was just absolutely uh, a, a revelation to me as, as what all is going on. So that any architect or builder uh, who, who works on the older buildings, especially the turn of the century buildings, it's like uh, archeology. span You dig into these buildings and you try to figure out how did they get built? How does that detail work? How are those loads transmitted? What is supporting it? What keeps this held together with that? What prevents leakage? Why did they fail? All of those things become absolutely, um, I hate to say it, but it's actually quite delightful to work on older renovations. Um, but even working on some of the um, buildings built in the 70s and 80s, there's a, there is a process of investigating to find out how did they do it if you, if you don't have the documentation. Uh, Matt, I'm glad you're here. Uh, you and I worked on one of those uh, hotels uh, and discovering issues that uh, we had to address because all the documentation that we needed wasn't quite there. So investigating this stuff and then having access to resources like these old handbooks um, is, is just uh, kind of candy for the architects. Well, if, if I could just do a slight advertisement, <laughs> that's actually um, what I consult on is, um, you know, especially um, it's the high tech materials um, that were introduced in the 19th and early 20th century that are unfamiliar. And um, I um, help identify them and find, um, uh, information about them and um, uh, you know it's people often jump to conclusions in fact that's how I sort of <laughs> why I'm speaking to you is because I, I mentioned that people often have um, you know I, I heard a, a talk about heavy timber construction which I, I, I thought you know could be better and um, and it's a topic I've I've written about and researched, and um, you know people sort of jump to conclusions. They you know don't you know like what seems logical. Oh, they must have done this. But actually, you know, if you're a historian, you know it's it's often not what you think. You know why things happened and what they are. So um, yes, it's it, it is fascinating stuff, and it's it's my research especially. Right. So for those of us who renovate our own homes, uh, how, many how many times do we find problems and we wonder why did they do that? So when I, many years ago, I worked on uh, Boston City Hospital, uh, what's now called the Menino Pavilion. Um, I worked with a superintendent and he had come up in the trades uh, in the 1940s and 50s. And he was telling me that uh, the construction te uh, techniques that my house has, my house dates from 1914, uh, were the same detail types that they were doing in the 1940s. And I was, quite honestly, I was shocked because I, would, I, I was hoping that I'd learned something um, by the 1940s, but uh, to all that timber that they notched the joists, they notched the beams, 
and everything got locked together so that it couldn't go anywhere. And those notches are the, the source of many of the problems that I see in not just my house, but in many of the houses of that same era. Uh, so the archeology span is in some ways a living activity. All right, okay. with that, uh, we are nearing the end of our time. I'm not seeing additional questions, but Sarah, we have a lot of people saying thank you and congratulating you on the presentation in the chat box. I encourage you to take a per to peruse it before signing off. Uh, I will make a few okay. final announcements for housekeeping. Uh, I did post in the chat one last time the Google form for AIA credits, um, continuing education if you want them. Again, AIA members, just give us your name and your membership number. Non-members, if you'd like a certificate, just give us your name and your email. Um, all right, our next meeting is going to be held on September 15th, uh, same time, 8 a.m. Uh, we should have John Nunnery back after the uh, summer recess, uh, so we should get some initial updates for legislative and government affairs. Uh, I believe our speaker is gonna be Eric Montplaisir. I don't think we have a topic just yet, so I can't promote that. Um, however, the one other thing, uh, as Tarika and I mentioned last month, Drake is now our emeritus chair or co-chair. Um, going forward, so tentatively, I believe our September meeting will be our first one back in person at the BSA. Uh, details on that are not finalized yet, but we would like to do something to celebrate Drake's time with the committee when we all, can all be in person again. So tentatively, fingers crossed, that will be in September. Um, but recognizing that the BSA does have rules for term limits on chairs, sometimes enforced, sometimes not, Tarek and I are looking for anyone that has an interest in potentially taking on the mantle of a chair or co-chair of this committee. We're not actively rushing to the door, but at the same time, we realize that we can't stay on forever, no matter how much we'd like to. Uh, so if you have an interest in a leadership role within this committee, please let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about it, what the roles uh, involves, what your responsibilities are, uh, and to basically give you the keys to the kingdom so you know how to actually do all this. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or Tarika. Um, otherwise, thank you again, Sarah. Scott. We appreciate it. Hey, Scott. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Great presentation. Thanks.